I didn't introduce myself yet um, to everyone here in the room and everyone who is on um, on uh, WebEx with us. Um, my name is Nicolyn Woodcock. I am also new. I'm the Assistant Director of the Asian and Native American Center. Um, and before we hand it over to Eli, I would like to thank our student org, um, the Indigenous American Culture Student Association, um, our leaders of which are sitting right here in the front row, um, who really, uh, Eliza, President, put us in contact with Eli um, and then helped Kim and I sort of scramble and get the room reserved and get everything set up um, so that we could be here today. So thank you guys for your help with that. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to you now, Eli. Um, you can introduce yourself um, further, however you would like, um, and then tell us whatever you wanna tell us. Um, and probably we can do half hour, 45, 40 minutes of you know, whatever you want to do, and then plenty of time for questions and answers as well. Okay, sounds great. Uh, Hishche, which means hello in the Creek language. My name is Eli Grayson. Uh, I am a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, I served as the president of the California Muscogee Creek Association for about 13 years. I worked for the, <laughs> the television industry in California for almost 30 years before retiring and moving to Oklahoma. Uh, I've been involved in what's called the Freedman fight, uh, the five tribes for about 24 years uh, that I've actually found out and thought, wow, I got to do something about this. And I came into this history not knowing a thing. I've all, like most people, only been taught that the southern white states basically are the you know american whites actually enslaved black folk and no one else did and it was to my surprise when i was learning my own tribal history and the people in my family in the creek nation that they were actually slavers in the creek nation that they actually enslaved black folk and being part african american myself on my mother's side it was kind of a surprise to me i was like what so I had to start from the beginning to figure out what is this word Freedman? Why are people being called Freedman today? When the Freedman Bureau closed in the 1930s, the, uh, the Department of Freedman, the Federal Department of Freedman Bureau closed in the 1930s. I don't, have never heard a black person ever in modern times describe themselves as a Freedman. So all of this was new to me as well. So um, I, I don't do PowerPoints and stuff like that in, in a beginning lesson. I just really have a conversation with people to kind of bring them up, kind of like where I was when I first learned about it, just really through a conversation, you know. So the, and, and I'm going to stick with the Creeks mainly, but the five tribes that enslaved Black folk were also called the five civilized tribes. And the, the term civilized came after slavery had ended in these tribes. It, it was a, a coin phrased in the uh, 1870s by the Indian agents because the Creeks, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminoles, and um, uh, Chickasaws had fashioned their new governments and constitutions after the Civil War, mimicking the United States government, basically, and they got that term then, but it was after slavery had ended. Nonetheless, these are the five tribes that allied with the Confederate South, signed treaties with them to provide militia to the Confederate war against America to protect slavery, and they were fighting to uh, protect their sovereign right to enslave Black people during the Civil War. But I'm going to specifically talk about the Creeks, which is my tribe. The first known Black person that we know, a, a group of Black people that we know uh, in the Creek Nation was as far back as 1541. You guys have read about the Soto's ex exhibition through the Creek Nation in the South back in 1541. He had a number of enslaved Africans with him. A number, a number of them actually ran away from him and basically were adopted into uh, the, tribe, the tribes that we know of now as Creeks. But back then, 
they would not have been using an English word called Cree, nor would they have been using the term Muscogee to describe all of themselves. There were various tribes that kind of eventually became one nation, be, dealing with the, the uh, United States, Britain, France, Portugal, all of that. So that's, that's when, we, when we first meet African people with names, it was as far back as 1541. We do know by the 1700s, the early 1700s, in our tribal documents and our federal documents that a number of Creek leaders, chiefs of the different tribal towns, uh, were also slavers at that time because the Indian agents or the Americans or the British would actually write their names down and would often talk about their different slaves. And oftentimes the uh, enslaved people were actually um, purchased through slave merchants. It's all in, in books and stuff you can read on the internet. And, and this is stuff that strangely, um, I grew up in Mississippi, by the way. I didn't grow up in Oklahoma. I grew up with my mother's people in Mississippi. My dad is Muscogee Creek. And living in Mississippi, it's always been a black and white issue when it comes to slavery. So learning this stuff, it, it just kind of blew me away. And then to uh, do my own genealogy and, and read and learn about who my own people were and finding slave receipts from my fifth grade grandmother, you know, and stuff like that. It was just, I mean, I'm just, I'm still bothered by it, you know, but that is just what it is, history. Um, in short, uh, the system, uh, the institution of slavery among the five tribes, if you read anything about the Indian wars in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, before the removal period, you would often find the bounties or the, it wasn't just land that the Americans wanted or the British wanted or the French wanted. They also wanted the black slaves that the tribes actually owned. And it's right there. We just kind of read over it, you know, it's just because nobody really, it just doesn't translate in our head. Oh, tribes own slaves. That's just not kind of something we actually talk about. And we're not talking about all 500 and some federally recognized tribes. We're just talking about five Pacific tribes who historically are from the areas that later became the Confederate states, the Cherokees, the Choctaw, Chickasaws, the Creeks, and the Seminoles. And so, and all of them are from the Deep South, you know. So we get up to the removal period and the condition of the removal was uh, was easy and with my tribe if you wanted to remain creek you took your butt west of the mississippi and oftentimes that was done through the american militia or through human cargo companies that usually would be moving slaves from one plantation to another they were actually hired and contracted out to remove the indians so and in these records, uh, if you ever look online, they're called the Parkins and Perkins Rolls in the Muscogee Creek Nation in 1832. They last up to about 1838. There's 82 tribal towns then that make up the Creek Nation. And when I say a tribal town, I'm not talking about a place. I'm talking about political groups within the Confederacy of the Creek Nation. There was about 82 of them that were removed and about 20% of them you'll find on those tribal town roads were tribal towns that actually were enslaving black people. It would list the Indian or the head of household. It would list how many males, females, how many slaves they had, such and such. And you read, and these are documents as far back as 1832. So when you get to any, and, and that's something we, we often don't talk about on the Trail of Tears, we think of the Cherokee image of Cherokee Indians walking across the, the snow and ice and all of that from um, northern Georgia and South Carolina, and parts of Tennessee through snow and stuff. And some of the earlier paintings, you actually see black people, if you look very closely, carrying stuff. But it's not looked at too, because sometimes black and brown people can look alike in a painting. But in a lot of the early paintings, they're actually there. You just got to know what was going on. 
with the Muscogee Creeks, uh, we were uh, taken out of Alabama and parts of Georgia and mainly taken down to Pascagoula, over to New Orleans, put on river boats up the Mississippi River to the Arkansas River and dropped off in Indian Territory. And oftentimes on these river boats were shackled enslaved African people that the tribe actually owned. There's one particular boat called the, it was a, a, a tribal town called Hejiti. And the Hejitis uh, were on a boat called the Mammoth on October 31st, 1838. And about 300 of them died in this riverboat accident near Baton Rouge. And when you read the claims that the riverboat captain made in the, against the insurance company to make a claim against the dead and, and the losses on that boat, he lists a whole number of people who had been enslaved by some of the Egyptian people. So uh, there are all kinds of records that you know, date back and show the number of people enslaved, including the Creeks had a slave schedule. So did the Choctaw and Chickasaw Seminoles and uh, Cherokees. They had slave schedules that were written every decade. Even the last one we know of was in 1860, where the slavers had to enumerate the number of enslaved people that they actually had. There was an Indian agent during the Civil War who estimated there was some 10 to 12,000 enslaved Africans among the five civilized tribes at the beginning of the Civil War. His name was um, T.J. Mackey, was the Indian agent. So if you ever go on the internet and read about the Indian agent Mackey and read his notes to the U.S. War Department, uh, you're fine where he's talking about these enslaved people, particularly in Indian territory. And he also included, uh, and this kind of busts the myth of what the tribes have put out, was slavery wasn't that bad in Indian territory. And Mackey describes it in details, and he describes slavery as chattel slavery. Do you, do you guys know what chattel slavery is? You, you know, it's the condition of the mother. If the mother was enslaved, so was the child. And what we find out, particularly now through DNA, is that a number of the freedmen descendants that we know of today are uh, part Indian themselves, part indigenous. Now, I'm going to just a little education here. Um, when I talk about Indian, I, I probably should say indigenous meaning people of the western hemisphere and then the legal word indian which is our people who are citizens of federally recognized tribes the federal government on the martin versus mankari i think it's in 1971 you guys uh, can google it the court actually had to define who was a indian in the united <coughs> states and, and hey guys sorry i got dogs um and they, it was a case dealing with the BIA and the and P, before we, hold on one second. Hey, Bowser, I'm in Oklahoma. We all have animals. <laughs> so there's the, hold on, excuse me one second. I'm gonna let them out. One, let me, one second. Sorry about that. On the Martin versus Mankari, there was a case dealing with the white employees of the BIA complaining that the Indians were actually getting a job. And the court actually had to define who was an Indian in the US basically. And the court basically says a Indian is a legal word, meaning a person who is a citizen of a federally recognized tribe. That's basically what it, that person can be black, white, or red. As long as that person has citizenship, meets the constitution requirements, the citizenship in that tribal nation, that person is an Indian. A good example is the governor of Oklahoma, who is a white man. He's a Cherokee, though. 
uh, the senator from Oklahoma, Mark Wayne Mullen. He's a white guy, but he's a Cherokee citizen. So technically, he is a legal Indian. But he is he indigenous? No, he's, he's a white guy. So, but he meets the constitution requirements of the Cherokee Nation. So therefore, he's a Indian. So anyway, but to go back uh, before the Civil War, uh, you had the five tribes being very mixed race. Uh, a lot of the uh, slavers in the Creek Nation, including my family, uh, you know, I hate to say they were more European than they were indigenous by then, but they were, you know, they were, they adopted the European ways, mainly because most of their ancestry at that point was from Europe, though they had some indigenous ancestors early on, 50 years earlier, a century earlier, but by then most of them were white people who happened to be Creek or Cherokee or Choctaw, or Chickasaw. Few of the full bloods actually by then were enslaving black people. Though we do find some, it's not many. Most people were mixed blood. Um, moving forward, and I'm, I'm trying to get this because we've only got a short hour here and we have to take questions. Moving forward, we have the Civil War breakout. And the Civil War is very interesting in Oklahoma, particularly because when you read about the Civil War, you never read about the battles in Indian Territory. And I, I want to go back and say when the uh, person that uh, said the African American and Indian uh, crossover, I don't like to use African American when I'm talking about black people in the five civilized tribes because black people in the five tribes did not get their American citizenship until 1901, the same time the members of the five civilized tribes that were indigenous got their American citizenship. It was all in 1901. So you had a whole class of black people before Oklahoma statehood that, that were not an American. They were either see, considered Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, or Seminole, but they had no American rights whatsoever. So when we're talking about these people, we can't call them African American. It'd be like we're talking about black people in Mexico, calling them black people in Mexico African Americans. It doesn't make sense. They're, they're black Mexicans at that point. In this case, they're Black Creek or Black Chickasaw, Black Choctaw. And in some cases, after the Civil War, they're actually called freedmen. Uh, so going back, before the Civil War broke out, there was a slave schedule written. And the, in the Creek Nation, the tribe wanted to know how many enslaved people were there in the Creek Nation and how many people were actually um, uh, the owners of these, of these particular people. So if you are ever online, you can read about the Creek Nation slave schedules. They will blow you away, actually, and you can read them online. Well, the Civil War broke out. The five tribes allied with the Confederate South to protect their right to enslave Black people. They lost the war. And as a condition of surrender, they had to make their enslaved people tribal members. Now, you might think that's strange, but guess what? Black people who were enslaved by people in white people in Mississippi, they had to become citizens of the state of Mississippi. Black people who were enslaved in Alabama became citizens of the state of Alabama. Same way in Tennessee, Georgia, or any of the Confederate South, black people who had been enslaved by those states became citizens of those states. Same thing in the five tribes. Black people who were enslaved by the five tribes became members of one of the five tribes that enslaved them. So the, the difference, though, was this. We think about slavery ending in the Emancipation Proclamation at the end of the Civil War, all of that. We think about Juneteenth that Black people celebrate across the states, June 19, 1865, in Galveston, Texas, was the last day that black people in Texas had heard that they were actually free. Unfortunately, in Indian territory, the enslavement of black people went on a whole nother year. It wasn't until April 28, 
1866 that the Choctaws and Chickasaws freed their enslaved Black people. It wasn't until March 21st, 1866, that the Seminole Nation freed their enslaved people. It wasn't until June 14th, 1866, that the Creek Nation freed its Black people. It wasn't until July 19th, 1866, that the Cherokee Nation freed their Black people. It was literally a whole year later before Black people in Indian Territory was actually free. And it wasn't done through some uh, act of Congress or anything. It had to be done by treaties. And these are called the Indian Peace Treaties of 1866 with the five tribes. And each of them are different. Uh, but, you know, for example, the Choctaws and the Chickasaws 1866 Treaty, they wanted to be paid for every Black person they were freeing. It was roughly $300,000 that those two tribes had to divide up and settle that for all the Black people they were actually be, uh, setting free in their nation. In the Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole nations, there was no money stipulation. They were just freed and made tribal members. The uh, Creek nation gave their Black citizens and the Seminole nation gave their Black enslaved people more rights than the other uh, four tribes did. So the treaties were somewhat different, but they were all ratified in August of 1866. And that's why for years, uh, the emancipation celebration for Black people after or just before statehood here in Oklahoma were celebrated in August and not in July or not in any days like that. So um, I know this is all a lot of information and stuff like that. You know, when when we think about the reconstruction years that came after the Civil War, it was very it was very strange in in the interior. It's very different than what was going on in Mississippi or Tennessee. For example, there was a black man who was enslaved by my family, the Graysons, named Jesse Franklin. And this is somebody I guess you guys will never hear about. But Jesse Franklin was freed in 1866. In 1878, the Creek National Council, along with the chief at that time, appointed him to the Muscogee Creek Nation Supreme Court. This is a guy who had been formerly enslaved, a black man. And he was now serving as one of the chief justices of the Creek Nation Supreme Court in 1878. He dies in 1883, but before he died, uh, the U.S. Senate came to Fort Gibson here in, at that time in um, um, Indian Territory near Muskogee today, and they had a hearing, a field hearing called the Conditions of Indians in Indian Territory, and Jesse Franklin was actually interviewed. And so we have his testimony from as far back as 1878, talking about the cases that he actually had to hear. And this brother put people to death. I mean, he had that type of authority serving on the court if a Creek committed a crime, you know? So you, he was actually technically the first person, black person, to serve on the Supreme Court in the United States. It happens to be an Indian tribe's Supreme Court, but it had all the jurisdiction of a state court. It was basically the same thing. You know, so the reconstruction period in the Creek Nation dealing with black people, we had my tribe, the Creeks, our government at that time was very similar to the US government today. We had the executive branch, we had a legislative branch that consisted of two bodies similar to the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. We called it the House of Warriors and the House of Kings. And so, and then we had the judicial branch dealing with the district courts and the Supreme Court. This is before statehood. And so uh, the former slaves of the Creeks had no representation on the council. So in 1868, when our new, new constitution was written after the 1866 treaty, the Creek Nation created three new tribes or tribal towns, as we call them, for Black people who had been formerly enslaved by the tribe to have some representation in the House of Kings and House of Warriors. 
your your tribal town had a, a member in the house of warriors for every 200 citizens in your tribal town and those tribal towns they were called canadian colored arkansas colored and norfolk colored they were basically political statuses and they allowed black people who had been formerly enslaved in our tribe to serve in our council so we had black people serving in the creek council all the way up until statehood uh, when the allotments broke out in indian territory just before statehood um, I don't know how much Indian history that you guys study at your university, but for the creation of statehood that happened in 1907 here, the, all the tribes in Oklahoma had to divide up its land and give it out to individual tribal members. Now, you ladies that are, are sitting there, this is just a fact that it's not a black fact or in the tribes. This is just a, a female fact in the Indian tribes. At statehood, at statehood, nowhere else in the United States, half of this state belonged to women who happened to be Indian or, or Black members of these tribes, half the land. And yet they had no voting rights till 1919. In 1907, at statehood, they literally owned millions of acres in this state collectively and they had no voting rights whatsoever. Their husbands did, their male adult kid, uh, children did, but the females in this state had no rights and yet they own half the land here. Black people who happen to be members of these tribes at statehood in Eastern Oklahoma that was part of uh, Indian territory, they received a third of the uh, Indian allotments before statehood. The Creek Freedmen, for example, when all the allotments happened before statehood in the Creek Nation, each tribal member got 160 acres, for example. In the Choctaw Chickasaw Nation, the Indian members got 320 acres. The Freedmen only got 40 acres. But in the Cherokee Chickasaw, I mean, Cherokee um, Creek and Seminole Nation, if you were black or red, you still got 160 acres. In the Creek Nation, uh, and, and I know you guys have maybe heard this past year about the burning of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, the 1921 race massacre. Did you guys see any of that on CNN? And you kind of wonder how did this black town become so wealthy in Oklahoma? This is why. Black people who have been formerly enslaved by the Creeks and the Cherokees, for example, received 160 acres apiece. In the Creek Nation, which is Tulsa sits mainly in the Creek Nation, Black people who were tribal members right, received 160 acres apiece. Total allotments was about 1,092,240 acres. That was roughly for 8,000 Black people. If you compare that to Georgia during the same period in 1900, where you had about 700,000 black people living in that state at the time, they combinedly own about 900,000 acres collectively together. Yet in Oklahoma, a small number of black people who ha happen not to be Americans, happen to be tr tribal members of the Creek Nation, own 1,092,240 acres. And much of that was producing agriculture. A lot of that, oil and gas was found on, and this became the oil capital of the world back in those years. And so you ended up creating these very wealthy black communities. One is called Greenwood, known as the Black Wall Street. Bowley, Clairview, if you read any about the all black towns in Oklahoma, it was they were mainly formed after these black Indian allotments. So I know this is a lot of information and on and on, and I'm trying to throw it all out here within an hour, but it's a very layered history that's very interesting, uh, particularly if you are interested in the history of women owning land in the US, that in none of the states as statehood, other than Oklahoma, half the land was owned by women. Literally half the state were owned by females and they happen not to be white women. They happen to be native indigenous women or freedmen, former, former slaves of the five civilized tribes. And yet none of that is recorded in history. And I bet none of you guys have even heard of that. 
you know, when I first heard of it, I was like, what? And then I started looking at the maps and the names and, and all the, the numbers that came with it. And I was like, why isn't people talking about this? This is so crazy. It's, it's information that needs to be out there because when we think about early history of the United States, we think, it, uh, we think about white males owning everything. And yet at statehood in Oklahoma, half the land, half the land was allotted to women and they happened to be brown and black. So um, we're kind of getting halfway through here. Do we have any questions from any of you guys? I really can't see you out there. I'm, I'm trying to, what I really want to do is entice you guys to look up some of this information about the black history among the five tribes and how it happened, why it happened, who are these people today, we think about historians like John Hope Franklin, who wrote about the his, black history in America. He was actually a Chickasaw freedman. If we think about modern day people who are freedmen of the five civilized tribes, Don Cheadle is a good example of an yeah. Academy Award winning. Don Cheadle, he's actually a Chickasaw freedman. Uh, we can name a whole host of people who are Hollywood actors that are freedmen descendants uh, today. So. Anyway, do we have any questions? <clears throat> this, this is Kim. I have a question. Um, when you were mentioning, uh, first of all, extremely fascinating. Haven't heard about most of what you were speaking about. So I would definitely be interested in knowing, to learning more about the <clears throat> Muscogee Creek Nation. Could you share with us... Um, where, well, I guess I have more than one question. <laughs> Share with us where we can go to learn more about the Muscogee Creek Nation and the other five tribes. Okay. And my, <laughs> <I'll>, before, oh, <laughs> before, before we go to that, though, my question is in regards to the conditions, the conditions of slavery within the five tribes. Do you have any information regarding, was it considered, um, similar to white slave owners in terms of the brutality and um, the inhumane treatment of black people as slaves, was that the same um, type of condition with the slaves in the tribes? Actually, slavery among the five tribes was very complex. It, it depended on the slaver, actually, how rough it was, but it was definitely chattel slavery. If the mother was enslaved, the child was enslaved. We often find uh, the male, the father of these enslaved black kids being Indian men. But in the Creek Nation, or in all of these, these five tribes in particular, back in those years, citizenship in the tribes were only passed through the mother. The mother had to have a clan. The mother had to be a member of one of our tribal towns. So if an African woman had none of that, didn't have a clan, didn't have a tribal town, but the father, who could have been a slaver or one of the, uh, uh, you know, ranch hands or slave hands or something, who impregnated her or raped her in, in a full-blood Indian, had a kid with that Black woman, that child would still be born into slavery because the mother had no status in the tribe. Now, we did have many cases of Indian women with a clan in a tribal town that had a husband who was actually a African, a black male. And her kids would have all the rights of the Indians, even though that child would be half black and half white, I mean, half Indian. So it depended on, everything depended on the status of the female in our tribe. Even, even uh, up until recently, when we changed our constitution, our tribal towns was based on a on the mother's lineage. If your mother was a member of one of our tribal towns, so would the child. But a male couldn't go out and have a bunch of kids and then drag them back to the Creek Nation and say uh, they're Creek. No, it had to be done through the mother. And that system recently changed about 40 years ago. But before that, it was only through the female that anybody had any rights. Now. If we talk about the conditions of black people today, these same black people, 
the Muscogee Creek Nation in 1979 voted to put these people out. There are lawsuits that are still going on. The Cherokee Nation under Wilma Mankiller is when it actually started, decided to put their blacks out. And then that led into a huge fight that went on for decades, 17 years in the federal courts. And the Cherokee Freedmen eventually won their federal case. The Cherokee Nation had to honor their treaty rights and, and make them tribal members or grant them their rights of citizenship found through the treaties. The Creek Nation is currently in litigation right now with the descendants of Creek Freedmen because the Creek Nation kicked the blacks out in 1979. And so that issue is still going on. The Seminole Nation in 1998, when Bill Clinton was president, decided they wanted to kick their blacks out. And they didn't want to share per cow payment with them. So they decided, oh, we're going to put the blacks out. And they did. And that ended up in a federal lawsuit where the Department of Interior and the Justice Department um, uh, fought against the Seminole Nation in federal court, winning that case. And the Seminole Nation was forced to honor the treaty obligations for their enslaved Black people. Now, the Chickasaws and Choctaw Nation, the Choctaw Nation, they kicked their Blacks out in 1982. And strangely, when the Chickasaws and the Choctaws were paid this $300,000 for free and their Black people, and they were to divide this money up, they didn't get all of it. And in the 1950s, they sued in the Court of Claims and demanded that the U.S., this is 100 years after the war, demand that the U.S. pay them for in interest for the Black people that they had to free in 1866. This is in the 1950s. And so they won that case, by the way. And the, federal, the Court of Claims made the federal government pay the Choctaw Nation specifically for the for the for that money and then 30 years later in 1982 the choctaw nation booted them out and so there's an issue there you know so this this whole thing of you know we talk about the everything is not kumbaya in indian country i can tell you that and if you're a tribal member you kind of understand some of the uh citizenship battles that go on because you're not talking about a lot of people only a small percentage of Black people in the state of Oklahoma are descendants of freedmen of the five civilized tribes. And unfortunately, their history is very unknown. It's often overlooked because we talk about state Black history and not the freedmen history or statehood, even here in Oklahoma. And thank God in the last 20 years, it's been a, uh, particularly young people, have been more interested in knowing who their fifth grade grandparents were. And they're actually shocked to find out that their fifth grade grandfather uh, or mother were actually owned by one of the tribes and documented like you wouldn't believe. And actually, strangely, the most documented Black people in America today are descendants of the five civilized tribes, the slaves, descend, the slaves of the five civilized tribes. They're not only given names and documents, unlike we see the slave schedules in Mississippi and places like that. You usually get a name, but not a last name. Or you get a number of slaves that this white man may have owned. In the five tribes, the slave schedules actually name the Black people and name their birthday and give them a last name. So we end up knowing a lot about them. But as far as the conditions of what slavery was like, uh, pre-removal, it was awful. Most of the uh, militia, American militias that attacked the five tribes in the Deep South, stealing land, they were actually stealing their slaves too. So slave, the enslaved Africans in these five tribes, man, they were shuffled back and forth from white plantations to Indian plantations, back and forth, not knowing where they're going. They were often the, the war bounty of, uh, you know, the, oh, well, we, you know, we conquered this Indian village and we're not only going to steal their gold or whatever they had, we're going to steal their black slaves too, you know. And, you know, um, they're not sitting around in a hut or a teepee, just sitting, with, you know, we got this, all this misinformation in the U.S. about tribes and how they live. And, and you know, we got this white image, this colonist image from the Europe that, there was no progress here. There was no language here. There was no religion here. 
So if you think about the five tribes enslaving black people, well, the black people must be just sitting around us because these Indians can have a life themselves. But if you Google, for example, John Ross, who was a slaver in Georgia, he was actually the chief of the Cherokee Nation in Georgia, and his plantation is still intact. The, the big white mansion with the columns and all of that stuff, and you look at it and go, oh, he's a Cher chief of the Cherokees. Why is he living in a plantation? Why isn't he living in a hut or a teepee? You know, so anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Uh, I, I had to turn off my, un I had to unmute myself to say, wow. So, <laughs> um, but also, where can we learn more? about the uh, oh, there are so many books and at the for example dr daniel littleville from the university of arkansas in little rock he's written extensively he's the dean of indian education at the university of arkansas he's written a book called africans in creeks africans in cherokee africans these are books africans and seminoles the seminole burning africans and choctaws africans and chickasaws these are books written about the, the years of the enslaved, slave institution in Indian territory among the five tribes. There's a book called African, in African Creeks by Gary Zeller, which is a terrific book to read about post-reconstruction years after the Civil War in the Creek Nation and the advancement of Black people in that tribe. Uh, there's a website called African Native American, which is about 20, one of the oldest uh, genealogy and history uh, uh, boards and, and websites on the internet, actually. It's dealing with all of this issue. But that's all you really have to do is Google Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes. And you would, um, it would blow up your computer about how much information that's out there, you know, including uh, records. Uh, if you, the Creek person that's there in the audience, there's a wonderful genealogy site called the Creek Indian Researcher. And there's, oh, hundreds of uh, documents, thousands actually, that Lance Hall has put up online. You can go to my Facebook page on the, my album, and I listed hundreds and hundreds of uh, federal documents relating to the Creek Nation, including its, you know, Black people's um, records as well, you know. So also I have a radio show. It's not a blog. It's actually a real talk show on a radio station on KBOB, KBOB 89.9 FM in Tulsa, and it's called Africans and Indians Table Talk. And it's live on Facebook every Tuesday from 1 central time to 2 p.m. And we have the chiefs, we have um, different historians and genealogists dealing with the African Indian connection. We have tribal representatives from the different tribes that come on the show and talk about this. It's a very lively talk topic here in Oklahoma because it's dealing with the Black issue. And we can't talk about the 1921 race massacre without talking about the individuals who were in that massacre. And that usually were the uh, black people who had been with the Indians for centuries. I saw just the guy raise his hand. Yes, Muskogee Creek, don't go. You speak Creek? <laughs> talk so far, really enjoying it. I have one question that's kind of historical and then one modern political. Um, the first is, to what extent did slavery kind of penetrate like the Upper Creek full blood communities um, pre-removal? It, you know, you have to look at the tribal towns and, and actually it's interesting when you say the Upper Creeks and I know we referenced the Lower Creeks, all of that is colonies. Uh, terminology used for our tribe when we don't use it ourselves, you know. So did, were there some in um, full bloods who enslaved African? Okay, so you got to think about, are you referencing a full blood from what we call a full blood today? 
because we back in those years there were no black crimes there were no uh you know that type of system that the federal government imposed on us that statehood you know so you you either were creek or you're not creek and besides being a creek is a political status there's no such thing as the creek race and w- even when you look at the indian um when the senate would come down to indian territory to interview the indians they would always start out with this one question what is your nationality they would never say what is your race or anything like that they would always say what is your nationality and some people would say i'm cherokee some people say they're choctaw chickasaw seminole whatever but they would never refer to themselves or what is your race you know they would say what's your nationality so people understood that in those days. Unfortunately, because we both have grown up in Jim Crow years, particularly out of Oklahoma, and where the blood quantums, the one halves, the you know, the the one sixteenths and the one over a million, all of that junk crap that the federal government has imposed on us, we live by those terms. So when you ask that question, if you say which of the tribal towns had were enslaving black people that's easy you can go to the perkins and i and i want you to do this because you'll learn a lot the perkins park part but per, per, perkins and parsons rose on the creek indian researcher in 1832 and you can look at the original documents just online and right there, you can actually count the number of slaves from each of the tribal towns that were, were listed there. And then it would also list the Indian who enslaved them. Now, if that person was a full blood, who knows? I mean, full indigenous, we don't know because we didn't have blood quantums back in those days. And what was your second question? Uh, so my second question, and maybe you'll get more into this as we kind of get past this question period, is is there any kind of um, like political pressure on like David Hill or Dan Beaver right now to deal with this problem? Or are they just kind of ignoring yes, it? Yes, it's in, in the Creek Nation, it's in tribal court, you know, and uh, the Creek Nation District Court right now is where it's been uh, dealt with. They had a hearing last week, week before. It's, it's constantly moving through the tribal court. And it's been the first time it's gone through our tribal court, really, since we've rewritten this constitution in 1979. There's a lot of pressure from Congress. There's a lot of pressure from the Department of Interior, where Deb Holland is actually asking the Creeks nicely to deal with this right now before the federal government has to deal with it. And the reality is, is that if you read the Creek Treaty of 1866 and Article 2, it's, I mean, a three-year-old who could read can read the Black people who were enslaved by the tribe had rights. And to take those rights away and violate your own treaty is very dangerous. It's basically the position of, of what Congress is actually saying. Uh, when we were dealing with the Cherokee Nation, uh, the, we, the freedmen couldn't sue the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokee freedmen couldn't sue the Cherokee Nation. They have to sue the federal government because there were two signers to the treaty. In that particular treaty, it was the Cherokee Nation and the federal government. And so because of these sovereignty laws that the courts say you can't sue an Indian tribe without their permission, the freedmen couldn't bring a lawsuit against the Cherokee Nation. However, the United States government also signed that treaty. So the free Cherokee freedmen descendants sued the federal government saying the federal government were, was not protecting their Article 6 of the Cherokee Treaty of 1866. So this ended up in court and went on for 17 years. Finally, the Department of Interior and the Justice Department when Obama was in office agreed that they were on the wrong side of the table and they needed to protect the rights of the Cherokee freedmen. It ended up in the district court in D.C. The Cherokee freedmen kicked butt. They won that lawsuit hand down because the treaty was valid. And so that settled the Cherokee case. With the Creek Nation, there was a federal lawsuit in that same court in in D.C. dealing with the Cherokee freedmen. I mean, Creek freedmen. But the the litigants at that time, they hadn't even filed for citizenship. They were just making a claim. And so the justice of that court said, you need to go back to the Creek Nation, file for citizenship, let them deny you, and then go through tribal court. And if you don't get remedy 
or justice in the tribal court, then you bring it to federal court. So right now that issue is in tribal court being litigated as as you're standing there. It's going on right now. Will the will our tribal courts do something about it and give the the descendants of our enslaved people justice? I don't know. It's hard to say. But it's eventually it's going to end up in federal court. Muro, thank you. Anyone anyone else have a question? Looks like we have all of our questions in. I, I do <clears throat> want to say this. If the state of Mississippi decides that they're going to take away, I'll, I'll take the state you're in. You're in Ohio, right? Mm -hmm. If the state of Ohio pass a law saying that all black people in the state of Ohio to have any rights, including voting rights, or even the right to exist in that state, have to prove they have white blood in their veins, at least one white ancestor, everybody will be up in the war. And so the five tribes have basically said that. They've said, well, these slaves didn't have Indian blood. And so that's why we want them out. They don't have any, and that which is not true, we've run the DNA. Everyone that we run, there's indigenous ancestry in their DNA. However, it had nothing to do with the fact of why they had citizenship. Just like having white blood, if you're a black person in Mississippi, having, black, having white blood in the state of Mississippi for a black person has nothing to do with their freedom, their rights in that state or anything. But in these tribes, we're allowing them to say, well, they got to have Indian blood. That means that they have to prove that one of their ancestors raped their grandmothers. You know, which is crazy. So anyway, that's a whole, that's a grown up story. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Go ahead now. Well, um, I'm thoroughly enjoying. We don't have any more questions on the floor right now, but if you have more to share, we absolutely would like to hear. <laughs> well, I, I just want to make sure that the, you know, those of you who are tribal members understand you are, you, your tribe is a political status that you hold. You hold dual citizenship. You hold American citizenship and you hold citizenship in your tribe. But it's not a race in citizenship. It is a political status. It's like being a Canadian or American or Japanese, or you know, if you're a citizen of Venezuela, it's a, it's a political status. And you, the federal government never signed treaties with races of people. They signed them with nations. Most Mexicans that come here from Mexico are indigenous people but they're not Cherokee politically. They're not Choctaw politically. They're not Ojibwe politically, you know, but they're indigenous, which is a whole different thing. And so until people understand that tribes in the U.S., when the U.S. government are talking about federal recognized tribes, it's talking about political societies, not races of people. And the treaties that they have with them are no different than their treaties with Britain, with France, with Russia, with anybody. It's the same thing. It's a nation to nation agreement. And so it's, it's you know, and, and there lies the power of your citizenship status. But as long as we ourselves fall into these blood quantum arguments of how much political status are you? is what they're saying. I don't know what, what the tribe sent you in a citizenship card that referenced your uh, blood quantum, but it's absolutely ridiculous, you know, because you have all the rights of everybody else as long as you're a tribal member, except in our tribe, if you're less than a quarter blood, you're not allowed to run for office, which is wrong because 90% uh, of our tribe is less than a quarter blood today using that old colonial, colonial U.S. system that was created in 1907. So, uh, how, how do they determine? How do they determine if they are a quarter 
Is there DNA testing or do they well, use their it technology? On the tri no, we don't do DNA testing because really DNA tests don't test political groups. They could test your racial status, but not a political group. Okay, so in, in the case of the five civilized tribes, we have something called the Dolls Rows, which are the allotments of 160 acres or 320 acres, whatever tribe it was. And so those rows were created between January 1st of 1889, uh, no, 1898, and April 26th of 1906. And so when I got enrolled in the Creek Nation, I had to show that my grandmother and my grandfather were actually on those documents. And whatever blood quantum that the federal government required, they have on that document, because the blood quantum for the five tribes came about, it was it was all about the the land, and it was all about the what was called the educational status of the Indian. The federal government believed that if you were full blood in the Creek Nation or Seminole Nation, for example, you were a complete idiot and you don't know anything about running land and all of this stuff. So they put a guardian over your land. If you were considered half white and half Creek Indian, then you were half competent. Anybody less than half was competent enough to run their own affairs. This is how all this stuff came about, which is ridiculous. And so, um, so today, when someone enrolls in my tribe, they look back at that particular number and then they calculate it forward through, you know, through descendants. And then they determine what your blood quantum is from that particular person. It's absolutely ridiculous, but we do it. You know, so, and it's laughable actually, you know. So anyway, not everything is perfect, but that's what happens. And, and the young man that you have in book, I commend him to, Really, you have the right in your tribe to amend the Constitution if you don't agree with it. You can change any laws, just like in the United States. You can change any law that you don't like if you get enough people to agree with you, you know. And so, I mean, uh, there are some tribes that are very progressive, and then there are others that are not. There are some tribes that allow gay marriage and others that don't even though it's a federal law, you know? So it depends on what tribe it is. If you don't like the laws, you gotta do something about it and get involved, you know? But you have a right to do that as a tribal member. <laughs> what? I just asked the group if they had any other questions and um, I think Everybody is okay. Anybody online? Because we have a few people that are online. No response. So I think that, um, yeah, we're a little over one, a little over one o'clock, a little over our hour. But I believe this. So does this conclude your information for your presentation today? Yeah, I just hope that uh, this would spark some interest in understanding the African and Indian connections through the five tribes. It's, um, it's one of the most fascinating untold stories in, in the United States. And um, you'd be surprised who are actually, like in Hollywood, celebrities and stuff, that are actually descendants of some of these people and they're just now beginning to find out. You actually find it surprisingly that a lot of black people in the, still in the deep south, because during the, during the Trail of Tears, during the removal period, the federal government allowed the tribe, the Creeks and the Cherokees, for example, Choctaws and Chickasaws to sell off a number of, a lot of the permanent Indian families did this. They sold off a lot of their enslaved black people mm -hmm. so they can, pay their own way to Indian territory instead of going with the militia of the human cargo companies. And so we hear these stories, for example, in Mississippi. You, I heard you when I was a kid, black people all the time, they're saying, oh, my granny was a Blackfoot Indian. And yet, if you were Creek, 
and you know anything about Creek history, you knew that was one of the derogatory terms or words that were used by white plantation owners that describe black people who had been enslaved by the Creeks before the removal. And so there's still so much of that that's not taught, not known, it's overlooked. You got, you know, so if you're just interested in unusual history that hard, people hardly talk about because we're, you know, we talk about really African American history, but we don't talk about African Indian history um, in the States. And it's actually the beginning of black history in the United States. I mean, the first black person enslaved in the tribes was in 1541, not 1619. You know, and we have this whole 16. Matter of fact, I saw a map this morning on the internet. Someone sent it to me. Um, it's a new project going on, and it's talking about the Underground Railroads. And strangely, they leave Oklahoma out. They only show, show slavery in the Deep South, mm -hmm. and they left Oklahoma out. And so I messaged the person who created the map, and I said, why did you leave Indian Territory out, which is now Oklahoma? And he said, well, there was no slavery there. And I laughed about it. And I was like, Dude, you need to do your homework. You know, so anyway, yeah. So um, we've got a couple questions that came in. Um, with the um, WebEx viewers. First question, um, it says, it doesn't sound like the tribes are very accepting. Are the tribes today uh, far removed generations? Uh, you know, and, and I, I have to say this, like in the US, everybody has opinions about something, but the federal government get blamed for bad stuff and we all fall under that. And yet, a lot of us don't agree with some of the stuff they, that the government may be doing. It's the same way in the tribes. We have, I'm a tribal member, and I think that the freedmen have a right to all of their uh, uh, rights that were established in the treaty. Yet, I'm a voice, there are a whole, I, you know, I often say about 60, 70% currently of my tribe, the Creek Nation, will agree if there was a vote on it that the freedmen have rights. Yet the people that control the tribe don't agree because it challenges their political power. And so it's not that the whole tribes, all the, the members of these tribes agree that black people have no rights. It's usually a very small percentage that don't, that don't want them in the tribe, but they have a lot of power. They control the purse. They control the government. They do that. But everybody else gets blamed for, it, you know, now, I often say, when you talk about are they removed, I'm thinking they're saying are they removed from old Indian ways. Well, we establish, I, I'm not one of those people that you're going to put me in a box to just make baskets and look like an Indian with a feather in my head. That's not going to happen. I don't live in a teepee. My house is 6,000 square feet. You know, and I often say the most traditional thing we do as tribal members and the five civilized tribes in eastern Oklahoma is that we shop at Walmart. We hunt in the meat section. We hunt, we grow our vegetables in the garden section of Walmart. And that's the most traditional thing we do. And I don't let people become super Indian around me to say, well, we did this, we did this. And because you're not doing this, then you're not a good Indian or you're not a good Creek or you're not a good Cherokee. Or Nobody has a right to tell you that. Just like Nobody has a right to tell you how American you are based on how you dress or what you do in your day, you know, because they're political status, you know, so whatever you do in your day, and if you're a creep, that's what you do. That's your tradition. Um, they would also like you to repeat the information about your radio show, the, the how to get it. It's with called Africans in Indians Table Talk. It's on KBOB 89.9 FM. It's on Facebook Live each Tuesday. It's on the radio here in Tulsa. But on Facebook, I mean, we get messages from Germany and Japan often on that show. Uh, it's live at 1 p.m. Central. It goes to 2 o'clock. We have fascinating guests from like a couple of weeks ago. Esperanza Spaulding, who's a Choctaw Freedman descendant, was on. 
-hmm. We have tribal chiefs. We got the uh, Cherokee Nation chief coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have historians, genealogists. We have just normal people that come on and tell us their stories uh, about what their grannies or grandfathers were like and what they knew as kids. So it's something, you know, and not just uh, black Indians, we have just Indians and white Indians as well that come on and talk about different things in their life. It's a very fascinating show. The one we did yesterday, I encourage you to go on KBOB 89.9 after I'm on Facebook and see that show. We had a woman named Angela Raji who lives in Baltimore and she's a historian on the Choctaw Chickasaw Freeman. And some of the stories that she was telling that she's written about and researched for decades will blow you away. And it goes back to one of your questions about what was slavery like? She talked about some of the individual lives that she was able to research. And some people were okay, they did okay, they got by. Some people were actually murdered, burned alive by their Chickasaw slavers. And so she talks about all of this in um, the book she's written about it and on and on. That was yesterday's show, if somebody wants to uh, go back and see that show. KBOB 89.9. And I'm on Facebook, Eli Grayson. Um, there's only four of us in the country, so it's not hard to figure out who I am. Well, I, I absolutely agree that I hope that this information will spark some of our college students into doing more research and yeah. sharing this information more. And that's the whole, my whole um, purpose with these talks is to give information to our students and to the public who may not have otherwise ever heard about it. Because yeah. I certainly had not. Also, um, I've been in a number of documentaries, but one of my favorites was done by CNN recently, uh, well, last year on the 21 Race Massacre. It was produced by James LeBron, so LeBron James, the basketball player, and uh, it's called Dreamland. And it talks about the 1921 Race Massacre, but the beginning of it talks about this history that we're talking about, the Black history among the five tribes and how they got here, how black people got to Oklahoma and how these towns overnight became extremely wealthy. Um, there's a book called Researching Sarah Rector. I want to say that again, Researching Sarah Rector. It's about the richest black girl in America in 1914. And she was a Creek freedman who got a 160-acre allotment here as a Creek citizen back in 1902. And her allotment, they ended up finding one of the largest oil pools in the world on her 160-acre allotment. It was producing millions of barrels of oil a month. She's running around with no shoes on. Her uncles disappear. Her brothers disappear. You know, on and on and on. It's a tragic story. And the NAACP is written in the Crisis Magazine in 1914. They came to Oklahoma and got her, saved her life, took her up to Kansas and created a birth certificate making her a white girl so she could start receiving her monies from her oil and gas wealth. And she had to live off that white birth certificate. She's a little black girl who's a Creek Freedman until she became an adult. And she was she became one of the wealthiest black women in the world, you know, and little she's very I think there should be a movie about her. She was amazing. She ended up going to Tuskegee College down in Alabama, educating herself, using her wealth to help the black community, black Indian community in Muskogee and later in Wichita and then Kansas City and on and on and on. And it's a fascinating story. It's just, it's just one of the most fascinating stories you ever read, you know. Yeah. I recently went out to her land allotment in St. Creek County here in Oklahoma, and there are still oil jacks out there called Sarah Rector 1, Sarah Rector 51, Sarah Rector 28, and they're still going. They're still pumping up and down, producing oil, 
She doesn't own that. She's been dead for years, but none of her heirs own it because it was sold back in the 1930s, I believe. But anyway, reading her story will give you a, a good insight of what went down with Black people who happen to be tribal members of the five civilized tribes dealing with the discovery of oil that led to statehood here in Indian Territory. And on their lands, a lot of that natural gas, oil, all of that stuff uh, created millionaires overnight, but also led a lot of them to their deaths. You guys heard of the uh, Osage murders? There's a movie coming out this uh, fall about it. The same thing happened with the freedmen in the five civilized tribes. They were knocked off like chickens if they had if oil and gas was discovered on their properties. No, I, I've heard of Sarah Rector, and you're the first one that ever mentioned, to me anyway, her her relationship to the tribes. Yeah, um, she's a Creek. She was Creek. She was born a Creek. Her her grandparents were actually enslaved by the tribes. She wasn't born in slavery. The slavery was over, but her grandparents were enslaved by the Creek Nation. But her parent, they became tribal members. Her parents became tribal members. And when they were born, and then she was born a Creek. Yeah. And she was actually technically born an American citizen, one of the first ones, because she was born after 1901. Mm -hmm. The freedmen received their American citizenship in 1901, along with the Indians of the five tribes. Mm -hmm. And 19, it's called the Five Civilized Tribes American Citizenship Act of 1901. And it gave all the members, including their black members, American citizenship. Oh, so anyone else have any questions, statements, anything you'd like to mention? No? Okay. Well, I definitely, definitely appreciate you and the information that you have. Am I muted? Oh, and the information that you've shared with us, invaluable. I'm going to be doing my own research. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, if you guys ever decide to do a in-depth talk where you really want to talk about specific individuals, I'd mm -hmm. love to do that, man, because this is just the beginning of letting people know how, I mean, in a sense, short, it's, you know, we've run through it, but we could take time to actually, the years between you know, 1820 and 1840, the most fascinating time in Creek Indian history. Or we can go between the Civil War and what happened during the Civil War, where the Cherokee Nation, listen to this. We have a chief named Obikali Yahola, who was also a slaver. His name was Gouge on the, on the records, old, Gouge, old man Gouge. He was actually one of the largest slavers in Indian territory. But he decided to free his enslaved people when Lincoln decided to emancipate black people in the South. And so when the Civil War broke out here in Indian Territory, the old chief, Obikali Yahola Gouge, decided to take any Indians and black people who wanted to follow him to the free state of Kansas to avoid the Civil War that was taking place in Indian Territory. Well, a lot of thousands of people decided to do that. And they met in what we call Okmuggy today, where his ranch was, or plantation was. And then follow him up through what we call Tulsa today, and then cross the Cherokee Nation. Tulsa is a strange city. It sits in three tribal reservations, to so the Osage Nation to the northwest, uh, the Cherokee Nation to the northeast of the town, and most of Tulsa sits in the Muscogee Creek Nation. So when these black people, and Tulsa wasn't there at this time, it just happened that those were the boundaries. Matter of fact, the Osage Nation wasn't there at that time. The Osage ended up buying that land from the Cherokee Nation. It became Osage County and later, I mean, it became Osage Nation. Now it's Osage County. But during that time, it was just the Cherokee Nation. Well, when Obikali Yahola crossed with his people following him, thousands of people running for their lives to get out of these wars that were happening here. They crossed over into the Cherokee Nation. And the last Confederate general to surrender during the Civil War was a Cherokee named Stan Wade. He was a general. 
He's the last Confederate general to surrender. His name is Stan Wavy, and he was a Cherokee. Well, his group of uh, militia for the Confederates attacked these helpless people, Indians and Black people who were running for their lives over in the Cherokee Nation. And over in two battles, over 700 people were slaughtered, including Black women and kids. And the male Indians and female Indians were actually captured and put in war camps. And But the, if you were Black and had been enslaved, the Cherokees were like, how dare you want to be free? And so they just killed you on the spot. And so it's just a little history that, it's a wow. big history that's little known in American books because it's dealing with something that we rather see Indians in teepees and looking like Navajos than we do living in plantations. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. So I thank you and definitely interested in um, revisiting with you and having you join us again and we talk a bit more specifically and in depth on these topics. So I'll reach out and we'll see what we can get arranged. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. And uh, to the to the Muskogee Creek that's sitting there, have you, I have a question for him. Have you learned any Creek? Uh, a handful of phrases. Do you have it? Do you have the Muskogee app on your cell phone? I do. Okay. Well, hum down Chihi Jagadis. We'll see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. I don't know. Oh, I have to turn it Thanks for coming.